it. So thank you very much for the piece here and there as well for the online attendance. And I mean, I don't want to go through a very big introduction is we are going to have a six different presentation and an introduction done as well by um by who uh, colleague so normally we know that an emergency always pose an immense challenge to the health system worldwide and the, the efficiency for management is crucial on the response and as well in the after in the phase out of the emergency so we saw how we are going to see how you chase through with uh, his capacity of adaptability and uh, implementation uh, is going to play a key role uh, on, uh, on this. So without no further, I want to introduce, uh, to introduce, sorry, Karl Schenkel from WHO, which is going to do an introduction to the collaborative surveillance for health emergency preparedness, response, and resilience. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So colleagues, um, I wanted to, to provide you with a brief overview of, of the new strategic approach of WHO headquarters and regions. The integration of the regional approaches actually, but it's the overarching principle. And many things have already been said by Mel and Steph and Actually, I, I don't have to, to start again with this presentation. Nevertheless, I, I provided a brief overview. I think there's going to be more. Um, Miroka is also presenting later on the integration of parts of early warning. And, and that's why I'm not um, emphasizing those aspects too much. So there's going to be more later. Uh, so I wanted to talk about um, HEPR. The health emergency preparedness response and res uh, res response and resilience framework that the DGWHO has announced a while ago. Um, this is a framework um, that is meant to improve a, health, a global health emergency preparedness. And under this framework, there have been five interconnected components uh, defined, and one of them is collaborative surveillance. Now, collaborative surveillance on the right hand side, you find on this slide the definition. I won't spell it out, but it's mainly about understanding surveillance in a new approach uh, about multiple information sources. So, um, one of the major lessons learned, not only, only from COVID 19, but also other major recent events such as Ebola in African countries, has been that if we follow just a very orthodox classical surveillance approach around indicator-based surveillance and hopefully some elements of event-based surveillance but it's not enough often to translate that into adequate timely public health action so we need to expand this concept towards other partly contextual components which are around or connecting to the information on the health system the availability of hospital beds ICU beds, oxygen supplies, vaccination coverage, et cetera, et cetera, effectiveness, effectiveness of the health workforce, and many other things. And all that needs to be contextualized and helps us to triangulate the existing surveillance information into the most effective public health action. So the lessons learned are amongst others that we, we, we need to know about health facilities, are they coping? which are the most affected and most vulnerable population parts. The decision-making in the beginning of an event, is this a true outbreak or is it a pseudo outbreak? And how are we going to follow up this? How many cases and deaths do we have to monitor each day on a day-to-day -day basis in the ongoing event monitoring? And then how to adjust the response, which are the additional resource needs that we have are our interventions effective or do they need to have, have need to be amended? And last not least, all the biological information uh, once virus have been birthed or other pathogens, which uh, variants are circulating, uh, which are the most dangerous ones, and so on. Now at the heart of this concept is really that we are talking here about multiple information sources, not only in the public health sector, 
but also across the other sectors. So we see this is clearly a, a concept that addresses equally the animal, the veterinary and agricultural sector and the environmental sector. We're talking here about integration within uh, between inter, uh, integrator-based surveillance and event-based surveillance, which ideally is integrated in, in national health systems. We are going beyond this, this concept and integrate here healthcare availability information, contextualized information, also uh, behavioral and society ins insights, uh, for example, compliance to social distancing measures, social mobility data um, that you can derive from uh, cell phones and, and, and specific hazards and threats in the so-called vertical disease silos, integrating them across the horizontal early detection needs. And all that together is at the heart of this concept of collaborative surveillance. So the three main objectives here are, once has been mentioned, integration. A lot of integration has been mentioned here from Steph and Nora's side. Um, number two, um, that is mainly around um, the lab needs and net, net lab strengthening capacities, amongst others, point of care testing and the need for strengthening national capacities for genomic surveillance. And number three is mainly talking about collaborative approaches for event detection. That here means interoperability. We need to make systems speak together. Uh, across electronic platforms, we need the necessary amount of standardization and integration also in the IT piece. And all these principles, all these objectives are underpinned by certain enablers around governance, uh, sustainable financing, culture of trust, I think is, is quite mentionable. And um, under this framework, we have a very comprehensive set of um, very detailed uh, capabilities defined, and I'm going to show you a few of them in the next slides. So again, back to multi-source surveillance um, that has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, lab surveillance needs, event-based surveillance needs for early detection, indicator-based surveillance, in including from other sectors, such as the animal sectors, impact on economy, social insights, people's mobility, healthcare availability and health and strain on health system uh, information, strain on hospitals, hospitalization, ICU admissions, oxygen supplies, vaccine coverage, the uh, effectiveness of the health workforce and dropout rates around that, all that needs to be seen together. As you kind of mentioned, these different surveillance needs are different across the event life cycle. So uh, in the peacetime, let's say, you have very much an emphasis usually on sentinel surveillance systems and indicator-based surveillance. Whereas in an early event phase, we have a huge emphasis on event-based surveillance. And then later in the event, we're pulling more and more information in around the burden on, on, on the health systems, for example, and that improves decision-making process. So different needs across different event times. And how is this now being done on the IT side? And I'm, I have apologies here for an example from Uganda, which is quite outdated. I want to, don't want to do you uh, injustice, uh, Prosper. Uh, this is from 2010. It's a bit outdated, but it's just illustrating, I don't take this too serious, the, the different systems in one country only, um, how surveillance data and other data are captured across which levels and that uh, platforms data collection tools, then feeding into data warehouses, and then tools for data visualization. And all of that goes together. And, and then different APIs working together to make some of the systems speak together, others not. All that occurs in one country, and you can see this huge choice of solutions and options. And forgive me if that is a bit outdated meanwhile. So what is the pain? What is, what is the problem here with this data collection? systems. There's data fragmentation that has been mentioned a couple of times today. We have multiple forms, multiple formats, multiple interests, multiple donors behind different diseases with different standards. Uh, some of them using suspect cases, others not, all these different case definitions. 
we need to harmonize uh, that better. Then the burden and duplication of data collection efforts is quite different across all these different systems and tools. There's limited guidance on standards and norms um, for unified and more harmonized indicators and the metadata around them and how they can feed into systems. Last but not least, delayed and inconsistent adoption of WHO surveillance guidelines. And again, these surveillance guidelines given by WHO are not necessarily harmonized. They are different in methodology according to uh, the vertical disease program needs and backgrounds for monitoring. And they're more following this approach of disease monitoring than the standardized approach for integrated surveillance. Now, I was talking about these capabilities um, under the HEPR collaborative surveillance framework. We have 1.1, which is uh, talking about integration and aspects. I'm just picking here a few of them. You can see how this all speaks now to those needs that I, that I have mentioned before. Um, there's mentioning of the integration of routine surveillance capacities across disease and threat specific verticals. That is between the vertical disease programs and then that being connected to the horizontal early detection needs that we have through event-based surveillance. And I know there are good efforts here in DHIS2 of integrating those indicator-based surveillance data with event-based surveillance data, for example. And then Miloka is going to speak later on other specific early warning needs and, and a system provided by WHO. Very important aspect, health service capacity, access, and usage monitoring. There has been mentioning of HIROMs in emergency uh, situations in emergency countries. That is really one contextual information need that we can ideally integrate through DHIS2 because DHIS2 per se is a broader health information system that captures this kind of information. And that is uh, really an opportunity here for a collaborative surveillance approach. Further contextual community and One Health Insights, we had a very interesting meeting a couple of weeks ago in Rome hosted by FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, discussing here how can we bring together human public health surveillance information and animal information uh, from the Empress I surveillance system in such countries hosting both of the systems or just one of the systems, DHIS2. I'm talking here about uh, very detailed about the data models. And this is really a, a very concrete approach of integrating sectoral information from these two sectors at the human animal interface. That is ongoing and work in progress. And further collaboration, the need to really strengthen digitalized um, data collection on the ground um, bottom up. Ground lab, just um, pointing out one amongst many others, integration of point of care diagnostic results into national surveillance systems. The need to integrate best specialized point of care lab results into existing surveillance databases. And last but not least, um, the, the interoperational parts, integrated modern infrastructure, scalable technology interfaces, a lot have, has been mentioned here around APIs, integration of data systems, but we also need, and this is what we want to work on, at least we want to, in the next couple of months, take the temperature of what is to talk with the global donors, with the disease programs around them. What is the appetite for better harmonizing the data standards and the metadata for all diseases, for one integrated surveillance systems? This is what we're going to start on. Uh, also in discussion with the global donors of the very strong verticalized um, data systems. Now we're following here amongst others, and um, this is just one of the major overarching principles. There's much more. Um, there's the, it has been mentioned here, the, the, the WHO data standards, um, but we're also following here the global strategy on digital health, which is talking and emphasizing about open source health data standards, reusability, reusable systems or assets, um, digital technologies, um, shared services, and the good comparable quality of services through uh, digital tools. And last but not least, the need to better harmonize syntactic 
and semantic interoperability between many different tools. One of the overarching principles are the SMART guidelines, um, also hosted by WHO, I'm not going too much into details here, but it's mainly about um, prescription and de description of the existing data models and preparing them to, to go get digital, digitally and then really looking in the very uh, granular details in what are the needs to make these components in digital systems interoperable and translating them to software. These are the smart guidelines. So the future of all this, what we're thinking, we're thinking first of all about harmonized case definitions. We, we, we don't know if we can achieve this, but this is what we want to work about, but also reporting standards for exposure information, for example. Excuse me, exposure information around um, food safety, food exposure, uh, sexual practices, um, any kind of exposure that is um, 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 important for reporting and contextualizing epidemiological information. But also, we're talking here about the non-functional requirements and how to make this data interoperable across many, many systems. And the concept we are following here is data normalization in the HL7-based uh, fire um, uh, interoperability uh, technology that's eating into different various data warehouses and then connecting the data visual visualization tools across those tools. And we have already started this work, for example, uh, HL7 fire-based um, data dictionary uh, and wireframes are coming from the WHO code data application and we have here uh, at least a, a framework and uh, data capturing um, templates that are following this standard. So last but not least, I wanted to just as a new division in Geneva and Berlin, uh, division for um, uh, surveillance systems, um, and how can we help in all those, in all those attempts to um, make things better interoperable and harmonize and we basically have three overarching activities connection innovation and strengthening so we really here together with colleagues in berlin um looking a lot into catalyzing efforts catalyzing funding convening communities of practice incubating cutting-edge initiatives and technologies um very much emphasis in berlin on open source information for public health intelligence but also strengthening standards. And we are really building up here a repository of up-to-date uh, best practices, norms, but also data standards we have in mind for surveillance that are better harmonized. Thank you very much. And I'm open for your questions or after, probably. Sorry. Press this and this. Merci. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, I mean, a lot of points were touched during the presentation, talking about um, indicator-based surveillance, even based surveillance. This point, I saw it will be touched by Rebecca in the last uh, in the last presentation as well. Integration with uh, response to emergency with other domain. Well, I mean, emergency response is really a huge word. So, thank you very much, Carl. And now I want to introduce Prosper Benisa from uh, Uganda that is, is going to present us uh, the, um, the experience of East Uganda in the response of the Ebola uh, outbreak that was recently uh, in the country. Question, we will move at the end of the session, if it's okay. Thank you very much. I will prepare you the presentation. Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, just to share a little bit about uh, uh, the experience of uh, using uh, DHIS2 in um, an outbreak. 
um, uh, uh, we used the with the recent um, Ebola outbreak in Uganda that was uh, uh, last year, September October, uh, which had a few cases as I'll share. Uh, but with DHS to want to see what we are able to do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some rudimentary way of, you know, what most of you may now think is outdated. That is the SMS. Uh, I know in this room, very few people use SMS to, you know, communicate. Here we have all moved to WhatsApp uh, and all these other types of chats. But um, uh, the situation is a little bit, bit, bit different uh, in where you know it matters, you know, and these are the communities uh, where you probably sometimes don't have connectivity, you don't have data, you don't have a smartphone, and so in the disease surveillance and emergency, you really need to be able to reach such communities because this is where it all starts from. So uh, I will take you through um, a few things that we've been able to do over time that have really gotten us to uh, being able to respond to some of these emergencies uh, quite in time to be able to, you know, shorten the, the length. Um, so um, for Uganda, for a long time, we've been trying to use DHIS2 for, uh, for case-based surveillance. Uh, but this case-based surveillance, um, looking at the whole journey since we started, uh, it's one of the implementation that is quite very challenging and very expensive to implement to the lower level. So we switched a little bit to see how can we start to, you know, start generating some of the things. So with the DHS2, we have the, um, the tracker, uh, which is uh, used for, you know, case notification, lab resulting, and, uh, you know, analytics. Um, really looking at also uh, feedback and timely uh, SMS and emails uh, notifications to the different stakeholders or the different players uh, in an outbreak or in disease surveillance. So this is part of the efforts that we have moved with uh, for since 2013. Uh, and basically, this is uh, the whole flow of how our disease surveillance uh, is meant to work. Some pieces may not be working very well, but at least some pieces are working okay. Uh, we do really look at what we call rumors for some of you who have been involved in this surveillance, but what we call alerts in, um, in Uganda. And, and this is basically based on an SMS notification, uh, an unstructured SMS that really gets us started to ensure that we are able to, you know, get to the person who is reporting and uh, and be able to start the whole process. So um, this is the kind of thing uh, as it is, um, um, really just starting with an SMS, uh, anybody sending an SMS, and then we are able to get back to them. So it, to us, it's more being able to register the phone number of a person who is trying to report. Uh, and then we can be able to call them and you know um, and be able to get more information, which information is very really, very really key for for surveillance that you can even you know start and then you're able to to reach out to them. So um, this uh, SMS is uh, uh, a part of DHIS too. It's not something that we've been able to add on. So uh, whichever system you have, you'll be able to you know in configure the SMSs to be received by DHIS2 and be able to re be rebroadcasted. So that comes into our central database, which we're calling the EIDSR. And um, because these are uncoded SMSs, um, so you may not right away know where it's coming from. So it could be coming from a, you know, a different district or a different community, and you now want to start doing the triaging and the, and the and try to find out where this comes from. So that you direct it to the right people to be able to respond. The nearby community, the nearby responders who can be able to communicate. So once that message is received, it's able to be viewed by different players. And um, just that text message is you know, triaged for configured, trying to pick a few information. Sometimes you have to call this person and get you know, to where they are located so that we, we direct this message into to the right uh, um, team which is nearby and can be able to respond immediately. And along with that, we are keeping a log of all the actions that are happening uh, from the time of receiving the message up to the time of when the person or the case has been reached, uh, case investigation done, even results done. So we have that log that we keep along. 
And then uh, the most biggest players are the district, the lower levels who are near uh, some of these um, uh, points of uh, intervention. So th this is typically how it is. Um, anybody who has um, a Ugandan registered SIM card, you can just go on your phone and just type a lot and just send to 6767. Now the 6767 code is a toll free uh, government paid uh, code. So that we also this allows us to reach multiple people. Um, during the COVID, most people are locked out. We even go and be able to buy uh, data bundles. So with this kind of communication, they could be able to communicate out of their bedrooms, out of their lockups, um, uh, lock and we are able to reach out to them into it to, to be able to get more information. Or people are allowed to move, who are allowed to go into that location and be able to. Meet. So what is really key is having um, this alert, even if somebody just stops there, we will be able to register the phone number and then we can get back to them and, and, and find out more information. Again, uh, in terms of feedback, once that message is sent, the system automatically sends you um, an, uh, a, a, a message telling you that uh, your, your message has been received and somebody is going to reach out to you. So at the central team, and the different regions, uh, public emergency regions, you have uh, any users who are looking at this system and they're able to look at these uh, messages as they come in. So this is uh, what we were able to add on which I used to for just the SMS management. Otherwise, all these messages are received and stored within HIS2, but uh, visualization of these messages is what we, are, if we have enhanced so that we have an easy to use platform and an ample form that can be able to help us to, uh, you know, record the whole, the whole um, the way through the investigation. So um, different users, it could be at national level, regional ERCs or district, are able to see these messages as they come in. And you can not see here, one was able to alert on a suspected Ebola case, uh, just out in the community there. And once it comes, uh, we are able to forward it to the right district by just clicking on this. And then this is what your uh, interface you are getting that feeds into your log of what uh, you are tracking. So at this point, you are able to extract some more information from the message, but also you can also be able to reach out to the, the, the reporter because they have their phone number and then be able to fill this information. Then as the investigations go on, once the district has also started, the, has received this notification. So once we, we save this, the notification is sent to the right district that we have selected here, like for example, this city here, and they will also be able to receive a message on their email and their dashboard, and also on their uh, phone, that there is now an investigation that they need to carry on. So at that point, they are now the, 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 the cascade will continue, and by the end of the day, uh, we should be able to see that what all the pieces have been touched, and we can be able to tell what has happened. Sometimes these are false alerts, so sometimes there are potential uh, outbreaks, I mean, potential cases that we need to follow up. Uh, so this is when it reaches the district, this is basically what happens at the district. So at the district, they can follow up the community, the reporter, to get more information. Uh, and this is, you know, the phone call back to them. Um, support on what to do. I mean, if it's a case that they need to isolate, at that point, you're already now beginning to, you know, put in some uh, emergency measures to, to be able to support this. Then if that requires that we now, the district now goes in to investigate, so they will get out with their case notification form and they will go with the lab equipment to be able to collect the sample. And at that point, they are also able now to enter into a tracker and enter now the whole first case investigation. And once that is entered, again, we have the notification to the different labs to be able to prepare for a sample that is coming their way for testing. So this will be now handled at the district level. Uh, so basically, this is what uh, our case notification form looks integrated case, case notification uh, form for both human and, uh, and animal and artificial disasters. And uh, again, this is I'm trying to show that again with SMS, we are able to quickly be able to notify the different, the different groups uh, it is certainly that uh, we have groups of uh, 
uh, the different disease domains uh, to be able to notify them that there is something happening. So it could be at the point of lab results. It could be at the point of, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the case has been not uh, registered into the system. And then, um, uh, this, again, are the stages which we we'll all have for most of our case uh, forms uh, for the different case risk management and outcomes. So at this point, again, we're also using SMSs to be able to notify the different, the different groups, even including the, the district responders who uh, have started on this case. Uh, with this, we'll be able to uh, at least uh, slowly by slowly scale. Uh, this may be a snail uh, um, in a scale, because when you look at since 2013, uh, the, the whole country has not been covered. Uh, but at least we've been able to train um, about 112 and 12 districts out of 148 districts and uh, all the points of entry and um, during the COVID, it really supported and uh, um, expanded to more uh, health centers and more and more uh, community health workers. Uh, so this is the, uh, the dashboard that uh, uh, the, the different groups will be uh, monitoring as far as these SMSs are coming in and the log is being updated. Uh, it will be around which uh, um, alerts or signals are opened or which have uh, been closed or they are under still investigation. And then it will be showing the different actions that have been taken along the way. Um, so if it was for the district, the district was able to go and pick samples that would also be reported in here. And also um, the kind of suspected diseases that have come out of this whole uh, uh, investigation of log. And you could see a lot of it was uh, for last year was around, for that period, particular uh, period, it was around VHF, uh, the Ebola and then also the action taken. So this dashboard is available at the national level uh, for the different um, players for the disease surveillance, the emergency public lab uh, center, surveillance team, the, the division of, of health, and also the other partners who are also involved in this, and the, the regional teams, the subnational teams, will all be able to see what is pending on their side to be able to quickly take action. Uh, so this is uh, during the time of the day and where you, the, is the alerts were all coming from. And you can, as you can see, over time, they all ended up into an area where we had the outbreak, which is this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this region. But all, is all the same, at least we were able to receive signals across the entire country. And again, this was really uh, helpful in trying to uh, find out where the disease is now going and spreading. Uh, so, and with all this, we've been able to again now center our disease surveillance into some kind of repository. Um, my colleagues shared about the so many systems that are being used in Uganda. The situation may not have changed a lot. And especially when it comes to um, outbreak and disease surveillance, there are quite a number of many systems that come up new and old, and the, you know, um, those which have been in the cupboards are coming up. So as, as in DHS2 and EIDSR, we've, we've tried to at least work with the different systems to make this as a repository. So after the outbreak and uh, for COVID and Ebola, most of the data has been now reposted into here that we are using for dashboards play presentation and also for file analysis and also the data warehouse that is being prepared. So I think all this can't happen without uh, challenges. Um, um, to the extent of having, you know, this number of Ebola cases, uh, unfortunately, there's about 56 and uh, uh, good uh, recoveries of 86 uh, um, survivors who actually we also still are using the, the tracker. We're tracking them over time for a given period of time. Uh, but the most uh, challenges that we, we do face and we have faced, of course, is the multiple systems, the new systems that come in, especially when the outbreak comes, that's when everybody now gets into development, gets into the country, and they bring in systems which are not, you know, uh, not being used, a little bit deprecative, and again, um, at the end of the day, then we find ourselves without even more data to respond to some of these uh, cases. 
Of course, the resources are always going to be the biggest challenge. This is not new uh, in terms of deploying, especially when, they, when it's in times of outbreak. Uh, this will involve movement issues to, to be able to move to the areas where you can be able to, to, to train the implementers and the field teams. Of course, infrastructure becomes a big challenge. Again, I've shared that much as we are all moving out of SMSs, the lower levels still have challenges of internet connectivity. For us to be able to enter these cases directly or even enter them offline and come and upload. Again, as you're looking at emergencies, there are always new comments coming up, the new sectors which are popping up because they also want to be involved in the, in the, in the response. Then again, also, um, as for some of these uh, um, outbreaks, they are very, very sensitive. A, a positive case will not be announced or published so quickly. So some of the systems in terms of integrating the lab becomes quite challenging. And then of course, coordination with the multiple players, as I said, many players now come into play and, uh, and um, are able to um, support, but uh, disorganize the whole um, data management. And in terms of lessons learned lastly, um, uh, we, we do learn that uh, even if you are not in an outbreak, you need to have your surveillance systems up and running. I think for most of us, I've always remembered our surveillance systems to come up when they have said, oh, there is an outbreak. That's when we pull them up. But if systems, like uh, as I shared, if we had to and cover the whole count and whatever, I think we'd have been able to pick that first case immediately. So we really need to make sure these systems are supported even when there is an outbreak. So don't, don't cut the, the money tap when, this, when the outbreak ends. Let's have it continuously flow to have these systems uh, supported. Harmonization of these tools. Uh, again, we see that during an outbreak, so many tools, so many requirements come up. And uh, if they are not harmonized, we still have this if it integrated systems. Then the lab plays a, a big key and a big role in terms of uh, our detection. Uh, and this is where uh, the connection is really, really key. Then SOPs for data collection, data management are very key uh, for us to be able to manage uh, during the emergencies. And then intersectional intersectional uh, sectoral collaboration is very key. Uh, we did find out that, you know, it's not only health that is in here, the children are in school, the farmers are, are, are planting, so you need to bring all your sectors, even when you're outside the, 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 the emergency or the outbreak, but very critical that if you can start integrating with them um, uh, along the way before the emergency, that is very key. The one health we have all been talking about is really key that we can be able to bring here. So last thing I want to appreciate and thank um, uh, the team, the different partners that uh, were supporting in, the, in this outbreak. And again, a lot of these partners really supported the SMS. I think at this point for the Ebola, this SMS platform really came out handy and very strongly that every of these partners was really linking it uh, to it because this was the first point of information from the different um, communities, reliable information and quick. So I'm um, grateful to whoever was able to support uh, this implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And it was super interesting to see how a system that is used that was already used before the Ebola outbreaks in the integrating the RHIS only has been a key component in the response of, a, of an outbreak. So now I would like to call Hanan Bashir that is going to talk about the, um, the DHIS2 intervention during the Pakistanian, uh, Pakistanian flu. So I will leave the floor to him. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity. My name is Adnan Bashir and I'm leading his Pakistan. So, um, I mean, uh, we are um, a new, his group, I mean, we've been established like only two years ago, but um, I, would, I would take up um, over where uh, Prosper left that we need to uh, prepare during the peace in order to fight in wars. So uh, we need to 
uh, we need to keep our systems up and running, whether there's an outbreak or not. So we learned this uh, during um, our, our, I mean, uh, during the floods that happened in Pakistan. Uh, we had this uh, IDSR system already in place uh, by NIH. It was it was being run there uh, with the support of uh, UKHSA and WHO. And, and one of my colleagues from UKHSA is online. He'll be presenting a very specific case uh, of flooding in uh, KPK province uh, where uh, there were a lot of lo losses. So. So this flooding, I mean, they basically washed 70% of Pakistan and um, uh, it didn't end it there. I mean, the, when they reached the lower plains, uh, it stayed there for like six to eight months. And, and still uh, we, and then, then it all started, you know, uh, small outbreaks happening everywhere in camps and everything. So we, we thought of um, using uh, or leverage the system that already had uh, and we had it in place, uh, that, that was IDSR, and then there was some um, a system that Punjab implemented um, in terms of HMIS um, with the support of UNICEF. So um, just first, I'll just give, give you a background with the how IDSR was implemented and HMIS was implemented. So it all started in 2018 um, with the support of uh, CDC Atlanta and uh, UKHSA, NIH basically. Uh, implemented, uh, started implementing the ideas. Uh, I used to work for uh, UK uh, uh, CDC Atlanta at that time, and I was the one who configured the system at that time. Um, uh, CDC provided some funding, and then UKHSA also complemented it. So we, we were able to pilot it in uh, around eight districts with eight priority diseases that the government had decided at that time. Um, then, um, after the piloting of uh, these eight districts, uh, when WHO um, uh, came into action, I mean, they saw that uh, this uh, 24 uh, diseases were required by them in five uh, drought affected districts of uh, uh, Sindh and Balochistan. So, so there we started scaling up uh, with this IDSR system. So, in 2021, NIH decided to let's uh, move from pilot phase and into the complete launch. So more districts were added. And now uh, currently, if we see there are around 114 districts uh, that are functional on IDSR on weekly reporting. Um, and they are reporting all the 33 uh, communicable diseases um, that, that were prioritized by the government. So um, out of 152, um, only, um, uh, I mean, we they managed to activate 114, and only few are left, and hopefully they'll be done. And then there was some government funding coming in um, from the government after realizing the fact that IDSR has been very uh, productive in terms of uh, data. So this is uh, just uh, uh, an overview of the map of Pakistan. Uh, the green basically tells you. Uh, the activated districts of Pakistan. So there are a uh, few districts in Punjab, a uh, few in Bal uh, Balochistan, and uh, some in uh, KPK who, who, who are left. However, Sindh and um, uh, Kashmir has been fully activated, which is a great success. So, um, I mean, um, the, the, we are in talks with H, um, IDS, IDSI, especially, and, and uh, we are trying to improve the program further. It's an aggregate system with no linkage uh, to laboratory. So we are basically suggesting them to let's get some uh, data out of uh, the labs to get the confirmation cases. And then only it, it represents uh, the public sector health facilities, which is which caters for like 30% of the population. So we are basically pushing them to let's integrate with the private sector as well. Uh, when there are some integrations, uh, I mean, there have been a lot of talks around integration since morning, so I will not go into that. Yeah, and then um, um, we have this another, not parallel, but a horizontal system that uh, UNICEF, um, with the support of UNICEF, Punjab was able to uh, deploy it um, in uh, 2018. Um, it was first um, um, piloted in five districts in Punjab, and then it's and now. Punjab has been uh, fully activated on these 33, uh, on, on this horizontal program of HMIS in all of its 33 or 36 districts. Um, 
coffee in Punjab now. Uh, there are many other the other provinces that are also showing interest. The good thing about HMIS is that um, instead of weekly reporting, it's 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 uh, on daily for, uh, reporting, like for the specific programs like disease surveillance. Then we have some for weekly reporting, and then some for. Uh, uh the monthly reporting so uh we do have colleagues uh, from unicef sitting uh at the back uh, you from unicef punjab and unicef Balochistan. so unicef Balochistan is also supporting uh Balochistan to move forward with uh, uh this uh, hmis of Balochistan, and we will be piloting it in Balochistan soon so here's a um a, a wide uh, i would say summary of that uh the sim has been already piloted uh, whereas um, field evaluation uh, for KPK, GB, uh, Balochistan, and uh, Azad Jammu Kashmir have been completed. So we'll be moving towards pilot uh, for piloting. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Balochistan will be leading on to this system because um, during the flooding, the two district, uh, two provinces that were most uh, affected were uh, Balochistan and Sindh. So, um, I mean, again, uh, we have a lot of plans for uh, these HMISs as well. Um, I mean, this is something uh, that we need to strengthen the current systems that we have so that we are able to uh, uh, move forward with, uh, more, uh, I would say, um, a more comprehensive health system to, uh, in Pakistan. So uh, here we are also talking about um, uh, integration of private hospitals. Um, and then there are some uh, electronic medical uh, records and hospital management systems that needs to be linked. Um, and then we have the two programs, uh, IDSRM and, and, and HMIS that needs to be linked as well. And, and some linkages with labs and logistic management systems. So uh, coming back to um, uh, the main topic, I mean, we have these, we had these programs already in place. Uh, IDSR was there functioning in Blochistan and same then even in KPK. Um, uh, uh, we had HMIS um, in uh, Punjab. So, um, I mean, this flood basically occurred in 2022, June. Um, I mean, uh, the, as, as the stats say, I mean, the minister reported that 87% more rainfall occurred uh, last year, and and then the uh, melting of glaciers due to climate change added up a lot of water flowing in and washing. So there was an estimated deaths of seventeen hundred people uh, throughout this uh, flooding and and then displacement of around eight million people across Pakistan. So um, if we just have a, a little bit uh, talk about the stats, like from July to October, there were around 540,000 malaria cases reported um, in the flood affected districts. And, and, and the dry, diarrheal diseases, dengue fever and measles outbreaks were all over there. Um, seeing to this, uh, the government had to establish this uh, National Flood Response and Coordination Center. Um, it was basically, um, Getting data from the DHIS2, which which was again uh, on emergency emergency basis, were developed, uh, and, and the frequency was changed from uh, weekly to daily uh, by National Institutes of Health and UKHSA also um, helped them uh, with uh, all of this. Uh, soon after uh, this. Uh, um, uh, System was ready. They, they started emergency trainings all over the country, especially uh, for the flood affected. There were, I guess, uh, thirteen severely flood affected districts uh, that need uh, needed uh, uh, priority support. So, uh, UKHSA, USCDC, WHO, and even JSI uh, were basically moving with NIH to support them and then to train them and to start collecting data over the uh, Some glimpses of uh, the flooding. Uh, and then, and then uh, his team was basically there visiting those uh, um, those districts just to know that how the data flow is happening and how uh, we can basically facilitate uh, uh, with the data flow and everything. Although we had a very uh, lack of historical data on the thirteen uh, priority water associated diseases that were basically uh, due to flood, um, but still uh, we had this IDSR repository with us. 
um, although it was uh, not a good comparison, but still we have managed to um, uh, uh, managed to basically see that how the um, diseases are uh, you know uh, spreading throughout these camps and throughout these districts and and even uh, down to the health facility level. Um, the data was being uh, subsequently visualized. Um, uh, we have had this uh, dashboard developed on uh, our very priority pieces. I remember at that time, I mean, it was all uh, so fast. Uh, I mean, it was happening so fast that we couldn't even you know, manage. It was very difficult for us to manage. So we had to develop this um, uh, public dashboard uh, that was then uh, uh, connected with the prime minister's main dashboard so that he could view all the diseases data basically, uh, or in all the outbreaks that are happening uh, in real time. Okay, so here's a, just a small screenshot of uh, the, the difference between uh, 2021 and 2022, and you can see the rise of, um, uh, rise of the acute diarrhea uh, during uh, week 37, week 36, 38, I mean, it, it has been, uh, all because of the flood uh, caused the diaries. Uh, we had this uh, discussion with um, uh, the, the health authorities, and uh, CDC was leading this uh, discussion. Uh, and we, we tried to present an idea of how um, uh, DHIS2 or any emergency uh, system should work. So. So, so it all starts at uh, down the health facility and the camps level. So we, we uh, DHIS2 does have this, uh, I would say, capability of collecting data through SMS. Uh, it, you can upload Excel sheets of um, data onto DHIS2. Uh, so it's 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 kindly a kind of a hybrid system. You can uh, use the Android version as well. So we basically suggested that we might have worked. Um, uh, means of data transfer you use because uh, if we if you see the flood settings, I mean there are no internet, there are no electricity. Uh, I mean I've, I've seen uh, health facilities collapse down to earth and and, uh, and people living in camps. So uh, so we cannot expect to have uh, proper internet connections there or uh, computers. So even with an SMS or with an app, you can you can report uh, uh, the diseases that are required. So uh, then, it all of this was supposed to go to DDSRUs. Uh, DDSRUs are basically district disease surveillance units uh, that were um, again already there before flood. Uh, these were established by JSI uh, in all of the districts, and then. Uh, there are some PDSRUs were also established. So all of these uh, data was, was being flown to IDSR, DHIS2, and, and, and then uh, this data could be seen by partners and by the Ministry of NFR, RCC. So this was um, basically an ideal or proposed uh, data flow. Definitely, uh, we couldn't achieve it because uh, everything was happening so fast. So we need to move forward. Uh, Okay, so I mean, this data that we collected helped the WHO and other um, uh, partners to basically align resources where they are, and, and there are some diagnostic kits were also uh, 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 basically uh, uh, given to uh, the flood affected districts. Well, uh, uh, we, I mean, it's, it's just two days ago, it's again happening, um, and uh, uh, we, I hope that uh, we are better prepared this time. So I'll I'll now move to Dr. Vasif. Uh, he he must be online, uh, so that uh, he could present his presentation. Dr. Vasif, uh, can you hear us? Thank you very much, Adina. And yeah, we will have our online presenters. So. Uh... Okay, if there was, if you can share your screen, please. Can you, can you hear us? Can you, can you try to speak in the microphone to see if you can hear you? Okay, maybe we are having some issue. Uh, yes. 
Is it sharing the screen now? Hello, can everyone. Can you share my screen? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Oh, maybe, yeah. Grant, if you can help us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Save okay, it. sorry. All right. And as well, we cannot hear him. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. One second, later, we are going to try to solve the microphone issue. Okay. Yeah. Just ask him to talk again. Okay, can you talk again, please? Yeah. I mean, issue always happen during emergency, so. <laughs> yeah, before what was possible with that one? Yeah. Can you unmute yourself, please? Okay. Okay, but yeah, we we can still not hear you. Um, maybe the problem with the yeah, so just no, he's coming out. Okay, so maybe meanwhile we are solving an issue. Maybe we can jump. To the um, to the next presenter, okay. Then we will come back to you, Dr. Wasif. Okay. Maybe we may meanwhile we are solving this issue. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. It's, it's coming from uh, from here, but yeah, I uh, maybe we can just start. Yeah. So if you can just talk to share the screen, please. We, 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 we can do after, we can do yeah, after. Sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So here with us, we have, we have a co-presentation, Mikhail and Mikhail, that will be, Mikhail, that will be our, will be our We are going to talk about the, uh, the use of DHS through, uh, with the International Red Cross uh, in Ukraine emergency. So I will leave the field to you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation. Yeah, like this, like this. <laughs> okay, cheers. Good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's been a long day, I think, for everybody. So my my presentation or our presentation is going to be very short. We. Uh, uh, we are uh, doing emergency in a different context. It's more of a humanitarian uh, assistance type of emergency. So this uh, use case has nothing to do with uh, with previous presentations, IDSR, although it kind of touches on what Adnan presented. Um, my name is Mikhail. I'm with uh, the Norwegian Red Cross. My colleague, uh, Mikhail, is with the Ukrainian Red Cross. So he'll be doing most of the presentation. We... Uh, have a use case where uh, we've deployed a DHIS2 for mobile health units, uh, Ukrainian Red Cross mobile health units uh, who are using DHIS2 at point of care for consultation. Uh, so we'll just walk you through that. Yes. Okay. So uh, just a brief overview of uh, the context. I think what's really unique about this presentation is the context. Um, and uh, the tracker implementation, of course. And now we just finish up some challenges and uh, future direction. Um, let's uh, skip over the slide and we'll come back to this. Uh, so, Michele will uh, talk about uh, URCS. Uh, Norwegian Red Cross is uh, a humanitarian organization. We have different branches, of course, local. Uh, activities with volunteers and uh, search and rescue activities. And then we have on the humanitarian side, we have emergency response and long-term programming. Uh, so this is kind of on the long-term side. We're talking about three to five year projects. Um, so we work in 16 countries. We have five regional offices. We have approximately 78 projects currently. 
and uh, supporting the primary healthcare facility level, uh, at community level as well in Africa primarily. We, we do water sanitation, we do community-based surveillance. We actually have a, a use case of integration with Prosper's uh, IDSR setup in Uganda. We have a, a SMS-based uh, tool, which uh, maybe is a, a challenge as well. Uh, we do protection and gender-based violence. Uh, from a DHIS2 point of view, we're kind of early to the game. We started about a year and a half ago, uh, and we're pushing uh, DHIS2 in kind of two streams. One is uh, internally using it to uh, do second level monitoring. So the facilities that we support, we try to consume the data to identify gaps on service coverage, utilization, uh, adherence to guidelines. Um, and that's really critical for us because we're, we're trying to reach vulnerable populations uh, in, in countries where there's been protracted crisis. Uh, and the other is building the capacity of national society. So these are the local Red Cross, Red Cross and societies. Um, so uh, in Pakistan, we've made considerable progress and we're partnering with His Pakistan to implement the HIS2 with the, with the Pakistani uh, Red Cross and society. We have some pilots in, in Syria. Uh, and that's kind of the two streams that we're, we're, we're pushing. So uh, Michele will jump in and he'll walk you through the uh, uh, presentation. Over to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mikhail Susko. I am analytics coordinator. Wait, second, in the... Do you hear me? I'm Do you hear me? <laughs> Where are you? Maybe. So, can we try? Can we try with the we put the microphone now? Of course. On the. Uh... Can you can you please uh, speak again, please? Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I will continue. <laughs> Okay. okay. Hello again. Hello, hello. My name is Mikhailo Susko. I am analytics coordinator in the Ternopil branch of the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. First of all, I would like to share a few words about its history and recent activities. The Ukrainian Red Cross Society was founded in 1918 in Kyiv. Today, it has more than 200 branches with 500 staff employed and 8,000 volunteers. The main direction of URCS are emergency preparedness and response, first aid trainings, healthcare, home-based care, and other social services. See the pictures on the slide. Next slide, please. Okay, since escalation of the armed conflict in Ukraine in February, 2022, more than 5.4 million people were internally displaced and almost 18 million people need assistance. The largest movements of internally displaced people, IDPs were toward the West and Northwest of the country, mainly women, children, and elders. Next slide. This slide represents movement partner support to the URCS. These three rectangles with uh, blue borders show us the Norwegian response to the Ukrainian crisis since 2022. Uh, today, the Norwegian Red Cross works in three Ukrainian regions, such as Ternopil, Khmelnytsky, and Dnipro. The main support directions are health services, 
primary health care, genes and uh, psychological supports, support wash in shelter and evacuation services. Next slide. Today, under the support of uh, Norwegian Red Cross, uh, 21 uh, mobile health units uh, are operating in uh, Hmelnitsky, Ternopil, and Dnipro to improve the access to primary health care to internally displayed people. Medical teams in uh, MHUs consist of nurses, psychologists, and gynecologists. They provide the following services, basic primary health care, sexual and reproductive health, mental health and psychological support. Next slide. Uh, the DHIS2 system was implemented in each of three our regions. We use the following registers such as primary health care register, uh, gynecology register and psychological support register. We have trained 74 end users. They are mostly clinicians. In each region, we, has, we have a data analyst uh, that uh, provides uh, support and uh, prepare, prepares the reports. Uh, during, we use the following functions of DHIS2 system on daily basis, such as offline data entry, daily stock dispense, Ukrainian localization and unique, unique patients identifiers assigned for each patient based on their initials and year of birth. For example, we use uh, the first three letters of Sony, two first letters of name, two first letters of uh, patronymic name and the year of birth. Next slide, please. Let's uh, take a quick look on our case statistics. Since the launch of uh, DHIS2 uh, program in October 2022, more than 83,000 individual consultations were recorded with 50,000 unique patients. Among them, nearly 38,000 consultations were provided to IDPs and 7.5 thousand consultations were provided to persons with disabilities. So, summarizing all about that, despite our few changes or challenges, I think the implementation of DHIS2 tracker program in our three regions was successful. Thank you for your attention. Now, my colleague Mikael will continue the presentation. Thank you, Mikael. Um, I'll just go through with some challenges and, and ways forward. Uh, challenges are initially, you know, uh, there's a lot of competing interests in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, when I was there in April, uh, things were getting started. The USCS uh, branches were not very well staffed. So there's quite a lot of work in, in terms of getting them uh, ready. So data management and uh, digitalization was kind of at the bottom of that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, on the list. Uh, so initially, there was a lot of push to, to, to show the added value of having tools like this. They were initially using Excel sheets, in some cases, paper as well. Um, of course, they go to a lot of remote sites. A lot of these IDPs are located in schools, colleges, some very rural kind of districts. So uh, connectivity was also a challenge and an issue. Uh, data protection was a concern that was raised, so we've tried to minimize collecting any kind of direct personal identifiers, consent uh, is, is required to enroll a patient. Um, the Android app has been really useful in terms of having uh, offline accessibility, but given we have three tracker programs where patient entry can happen on one of three, we have an issue of synchronization. And so we've uh, prioritized uh, the, the primary healthcare doctors to have uh, uh, seniority in a way to, uh, to register and then uh, psychologists, gynecologists who are able to use uh, Excel sheets or what have you and import in cases where there's no uh, connectivity. Um, linking the prescriptions uh, to uh, the daily dispense was also problematic given they have uh, 120 drugs and uh, setting up kind of a daily uh, 
uh, logistic management uh, situation was also a bit complicated. So there's quite a, a bit of a manual process there as well, right, where they're using aggregates at the moment. Um, and then calculating unique patients, again, uh, with three, three tracker programs was also a bit of a, a challenge. Uh, in terms of next step, steps, uh, URCS uh, is uh, basically testing the system and they're interested in scaling it up nationally. As you saw on the map, there are a number of other partners who are also supporting mobile health units. So uh, they want to scale it to all 100 mobile health units in, in 20 regions. So uh, we're supporting financially uh, and technically with, with that effort, and we're just getting started with that. Uh, and the idea is basically to transition the whole system to, to, to URCS. Um, and uh, there's more efforts in terms of uh, building capacity and so forth there. Thank you for uh, paying attention. Thank you very much, Mikaelo and Mikaelo. So, Dr. Wazir, I think now we can go with your presentation. Can you, can you share your screen, please? Yes. Is this one? No, okay, I, I, I found it. Okay. okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm Dr. Wasif. I'm a field epidemiologist working with uh, UK Health Security Agency as a health advisor. So just conscious of the time, I will move quickly uh, because Adnan uh, shared the context of uh, flooding in Pakistan. So I'm talking specifically about the Northwestern province, uh, which is known as Khabat Pakhtunkhwa province. So when the flooding emergency was announced, so to tackle the situation, the provincial government in KP declared flood emergency in August 2020 and develop a flood response plan to focus four major areas. Uh, the area number third presented to us the opportunity to extend uh, the technical support of UKHSA to provide to the Department of Health. The area pertains to strengthen the disease surveillance for early detection and response to alerts, clusters, or outbreak of communicable diseases in the flood affected area. Uh, so the public health people have a clear understanding of the correlation between flooding and increased burden of communicable diseases due to the fact that people have to live in camps or damaged places with compromised water and sanitation conditions. Uh, contaminated water sources contribute to high incidence of diarrheal diseases and acute viral hepatitis due to the accumulation of stagnant water, vector-borne diseases like malaria, cutaneous leishmaniasis, and dengue fever might develop into an outbreak or epidemic. Also living in camps or shelters in high numbers, people got infected to respiratory pathogens, skin eye infections, and snake dog bites are also potential health risks to the people affected by the floods. So a little bit of context. So before the flood uh, of August 2022, Integrated disease surveillance and response, which uh, Adnan touched on his presentation, was already established at the national level and also in the KP province to detect, prevent, and respond priority infectious diseases. The system weekly collects, analyze, and disseminate disease data by using digital platform DHIS2. UK Health Security Agency and other development partners supported Department of Health KP uh, to establish this system since 2017 as per requirement of international health regulations. Coming back to the flood and staying on the slide very quickly. So when Department of Health declared flood emergency in August 2020, a health sector cluster meeting was held under the chairmanship of health department and co-chaired by World Health Organization. Uh, the basically the participants of meeting uh, were discussing the different options to establish disease data flow uh, from flood affected uh, uh, basically areas. UKHSA in that meeting uh, proposed to utilize already established IDSR and DHIS system as an emergency health information system. The proposed system was to collect daily disease related information from health facilities and emergency relief camps in the affected areas and share real time 
with uh, flood emergency operation centers at the district, provincial, and the national level. The system which UKHS proposed at that time was linked with provincial health uh, reference labs to share the lab uh, data of suspected samples sent for confirmation. The system was also linked with rapid response team working on the ground uh, on the ground uh, to record detailed information of cases in response to any disease alert, cluster outbreaks. The system outputs in, in the form of analyzed data, daily situation reports, uh, and heat ma maps basically were shared daily with relevant stakeholder. The emergency health cluster group voted in favor of proposed system, which was adopted immediately after UKHSA IT team made certain required technical tweaks to the system. Little bit of context on the UKHSA work. The reason UKHSA was proposing IDSR DHI system to be adopted as an emergency information system because since 2017, UKHSA is working with the Health Department in Pakistan to strengthen disease surveillance by implementing real-time integrated disease surveillance strategy by adopting three-pillar approach. The rationale to use existing IDSR system as emergency information system was broadly based on the fact that the frontline surveillance staff uh, across the province and in flood affected areas were already trained on DHIS2 uh, uh, system reporting. So it would be easy for them to adhere to data reporting elements and timeline. Uh, the DHIS2 system itself offers excellent analytics to monitor the disease trends in the affected areas needed to guide and monitor response. The system ability to monitor disease thresholds and exceedances uh, was instrumental to timely detect any disease alert clusters or outbreak. Uh, the DHIS2 system offered wide range of solution to tackle information need related to flood emergency. Uh, the data and information was well secured in the system. Above all, uh, the DHIS2 system since 2017 is a sustainable model because it is owned by the Department of Health with technical and logistical sports of development partners like UKHSA, WHO, and other partners. So how DHIS2 basically uh, helped us in flood emergency of August 2020, the heat map in the left shows you the isolated burden of suspected cholera before June 2020. In the right uh, side after June 2020, and that is the uh, period when frequent rainfall started, you can clearly see the increase in the disease burden in up north, central and southern region of the province. This is a trend of acute watery diarrhea, both for suspected cholera and uh, non-cholera during uh, the flooding months. Also, these are the typhoid fever uh, and acute uh, viral hepatitis trends. The spot map for typhoid uh, fever clearly shows high burden of disease in northern flood affected areas due to the water and food contamination. Uh, uh, dengue and malaria cases were frequently reported during floods and you can see the high burden of vector borne disease in southern region of province because of water con contamination due to the drain of the southern areas. Uh, respiratory diseases of both uh, influenza-like illness and SARI severe acute respiratory illnesses were well captured by the system during the flood time because people were uh, living very close uh, to each other in numbers in the shelters and emergency relief camps. Uh, the, the DHIS2 captured clustering of, of, of vaccine preventable disease, especially measles cases in the central and southern regions during the floods and guided the outbreak response in terms of a mopping, up, mopping up vaccine activity. Skin infections and scabies strands are also well captured in the system uh, and guided the response. Uh, at the end, the modified basically DHIS2 system during flood emergency response. And for, for the context, I want to share that it was the first time when DHIS2 was used as an as a emergency health inform information system in Pakistan. So basically, the flood emergency response in KP, uh, it was well guided by the modified DHIS2 system. And it also provide a best example of a sustainable health information system, which can be used 
during the emergencies and also in the routine surveillance or the peace time, the DHIS-2 was flexible to accommodate flood emergency related information because we included skin infection, eye infection, dog bite, snake bite cases into already notifiable priority disease list. Uh, uh, the DHIS2 analytics supported the epidemiologist and surveillance staff to early detect the communicable disease, diseases to control the spread of infection. The system generated daily situation reports facilitated the decision makers and stakeholders to get the snapshot of health status uh, and disease burden flood affected areas. Also, interestingly, the infor information captured by the DHIS2 system was also used as a decision-making tool to ensure the provision of medicines, safe drinking water, and other facilities to the high-risk population and areas. Uh, so at the end, I would like to acknowledge the support of these people. Uh, the contribution of all these people helped us to develop and implement the system in a very difficult time. And uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasif. Our writing will run out a little bit of time because we're having as well another presentation from uh, Rebecca Kota. But uh, like, we have to go for, uh, for the photo. So, um, once, once more, thank you very much, everybody, for the presentation and for the people for, um, for the participation. I just want me to mention that uh, not really focus on emergency, but really related to emergency. Emergency, there will be another session for surveillance, early warning system, and what else. So I invite everybody who is interested in the topic to join as well on, uh, on the Wednesday session. Thank you very much.